Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you again for um, just today, Father. I thank you, Lord, for uh, just allowing us to gather, Lord. Um, I thank you, Lord, for just giving me an opportunity to share. Um, I thank you, Lord, that uh, we can, as, as ministers and pastors and elders, we can support our pastor, Lord, who has sacrificed so much, Lord, to, to, to do your will, Lord, and we are the beneficiary, beneficiaries of his sacrifice, Lord God, and ultimately we're beneficiaries of Christ's sacrifice, Lord God. So we just pray you would just carry this day and bless your people, Lord, in Christ's name, amen. You know, one of the things that I appreciate about being a Christian now um, than in the past is that when you have the Christmas season come, right, people tell you, what's that, what they tell you? They say, Jesus is the what? Reason for the season, right? Now, when you're 10, you'll nod and say, yeah, he is the reason for the season because you don't want anyone to tell you that you're wrong. But in your heart, you're like, my Sega Genesis, my PlayStation, my bike is the reason for the season, right? And I know when I was younger, um, and, I, and I say that's not everyone, but when I was younger, you know, you know, Christmas time, it was about Jesus, but it was also about, you know, what's under the tree. You know, you rip open a couple boxes and you have clothes and you put them gently to the side and fold them and thank your parents for the clothes. No, you don't. I didn't, you know, I, very unappreciative. But, you know, then you get that toy that you always wanted and you're like, yeah, like, that's what I wanted or that game and you're all happy and everything like that. But as I get older, it's interesting, like when you hear Muse songs like, Oh Come, Oh Come, Emmanuel, you know, Ransom Captive Israel, it's like crazy because like if you, as you study the word, you realize, wow, like that's scripture. Like, wow, that's like, that's really what God is doing. And so your attitude towards the season is really different. And I appreciate it. Like my attitude, like, wow, it's like, wow, like I don't just look at the virgin birth or the incarnation as just this traditional thing we go through. Uh, just as a backdrop to our fun time around the season or to our comfort time around the season, but it's really something that we can really engage with, and we engage, and the more we engage with it during the year, it means so much more. So what are the benefits of salvation? So let's turn, so first, how are we saved, right? So this is going to be a real basic message today. How are we saved? Well, we're saved by believing the gospel. So what's the gospel? Oh, Pastor, thank you, Pastor Eric. If you do not have a Bible, there's a couple things I forgot. So one, if you don't have a Bible, please raise your hand and someone will hand you a Bible. Also, there is a handout for today. So if you go to the website and go at the top, a couple items over, you'll see sermons. Click on sermons, about maybe four or five items down, you're going to see handouts. Click on handouts, and you should see today's handout there. It's going to be called, What Are the Benefits of Salvation? It should be the first one um, there. If not, um, I'm not exactly sure how it's named. I think I did name it The Benefits of Salvation. So if you see that title, that's today's handout, okay? And then when you get if everyone does everyone have a Bible? All right. Everyone has a Bible? Good, good, good. All right, so let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to read 1 through 11. So 1 Corinthians Corinthians is in the New Testament, right after Romans. If you feel like you need to use your table of contents, please do. There is no shame in that. Okay? So I'll be reading from 1 to 11. And I'll be reading also from the New American Standard Version. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you also stand, by which you, are all, which you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, 
and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. So we see that the gospel that was preached is, is by through the gospel, by believing the gospel, we are saved. All right, and I want to go through some other scriptures that just outline what did Jesus do for us. And again, this is a very basic message, so if you could turn to John, what, 316. And yes, we can turn there. We may have it memorized, but someone may not have it memorized. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to find it in our word and see what, it, what did Jesus do for us. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and read. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world, will, would, world would, might be saved through him. Amen? Let's go to Romans 5, 7 to 10. And you don't have to turn to all these, but I'm going to go ahead and read them. You can write them down. You can meditate them on, on them later. Romans 5, 7 to 10. It says, For while we were still helpless... At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would da even dare to die. But God demonstrates his lo own love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. 2 Corinthians 5.21. And again, you don't have to turn to all these, but just these are things, scriptures that you're going to want to write down, think about, meditate on later. 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And then the last scripture is 1 Peter 3.18, and I really like this one. It says, For Christ also died for sins, once for all, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. So you have these four, five passages. We see that believing the gospel is what brings salvation. We have eternal life through the gospel. We're saved from God's wrath through the gospel. We're seen as righteous through the gospel, which means we're able to have, we're no longer have to be condemned to eternal damnation because we, are, we have taken on Christ's righteousness. It's not our righteousness by our own works, but it's because of what Christ has done that we are able to be, be seen as righteous before God and receive all the benefits of being declared righteous. And I really like 1 Peter 3.18 because it's really holistic. It says, we, Jesus died for us to bring us to God. So it isn't just for us to, be, to get out of something, but to bring us into something. So those are just scriptures that you, know, you can meditate on. You can roll around in your mind in this season. It's a great season to do it. Um, so yeah, you can take those scriptures with you. But one of the problems I think we have when it comes to salvation is that we can have a very, um, three things. I would say we can have a very low view of salvation. And sometimes it can happen when you grow up in church. Like I grew up, I had, I grew up in Christian school and went to church. So it was around, so it was around me 24 seven. And I'm kind of back there. I go, I'm a pastor now and I work at a Bible college. So when you're around it all the time, you hear it all the time, and it's one of the, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's great. If you're blessed to get a Christian education, it is a blessing to be able to get that. 
if you're able, if you have parents and you have family that take you to church so that you can hear the word and study those scriptures, that is an absolute blessing. But some of you will resonate with me. Sometimes you're around it all the time, you hear it all the time, it doesn't hit you the same way. It's sometimes when you grow up with it all the time, you just, it's just not, it doesn't hit you, it's not in your heart yet. Or it comes in your heart, but then it leaves, or you drift away from it because you hear it all the time. And it sometimes takes really real work to make sure that we're really allowing salvation to be something that we really truly value. And just as a side, that's one of the reasons why I really so appreciate Mike uh, sharing his testimony, because we need that. Um, we really need to be able to hear people uh, share their testimony, because it helps us remember, like, oh, this thing is alive, you know, that, we, that God is still working, um, that it's not irrelevant, but it's extremely relevant, you know, and it, and it helps us re remember that it isn't just something that we say, but it's something that's very real and that God is really active and still saving people through that gospel. Um, so let's go, and I have a quote, the actual quote from um, Michael F. Byrd uh, from his uh, Systematic Theology. Um, and this is a really good quote when I, was, when I was going through preparing. It says, the study of salvation is called soteriology. The gospel tells us that God saves in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Consequently, salvation is the chief benefit of the gospel. Furthermore, salvation is more than the sojourn of souls into heaven. Rather, it is holistic and includes the well-being of the body, mind, and soul. I want to read that again. The study of salvation is called soteriology. The gospel tells us that God saves in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Consequently, salvation is the chief benefit of the gospel. Furthermore, salvation is more than the sojourn of souls into heaven Rather, it is holistic and includes the well-being of body, mind, and soul. And that's from Michael F. Byrd's um, Systematic Theology. It's called Evangelical Theology. And, and I really appreciated the Lord leading me to that quote because that's really kind of the meat of what we're trying to talk about today is that the salvation, yes, we are saved to go to heaven, to be with God forever, but salvation is, a lot, is much more than that. So let's go to our handout today. You should have a handout for those that are watching online. Um, the handout, again, is under sermons. You go to, at the top sermons, click on that. You drop down a couple items down, you should see the section that's called handouts. So we're just going to go through the handout, and then I will be out of your way. Sometimes we think salvation is mainly a past event where we say a prayer to accept Christ into our lives, get a ticket into heaven, and the rest of our lives is just a waiting game before we finally get to enter into the presence of the Lord. It is true that we are waiting for our true home, yet while we are still on this side of heaven, we are, call, we are called to be ready to meet Christ. Um, and one of the things that we have to remember is that it's not just a ticket that you get punched. It's a whole, just like that quote I mentioned to you, it's a holistic thing. It involves something that happens in the future, right? When Jesus comes back, we're, our, we'll be resurrected, right? Our bodies will be changed. But then there's also activity and things that should be happening to, happening to us now if we're truly saved. We should see a manifestation of the Spirit if we're truly saved. Our lives should be trained, changed if we're truly saved. Now, again, and I'm going to jump to the end, um, just kind of jump to the end at the, at the end part of the handout so we can just understand where we're going. But really, one of the things we have, we have to do is examine ourselves. Are we truly experiencing the benefits of salvation? You know, and that's something that you can, some, you can ask someone Am I saved or not saved? But really, it's all of our personal responsibility to examine our lives according to the Scriptures and realize and put ourselves up to the mirror of the Scriptures and ask ourselves, am I truly born again? You know, someone else can tell you you're saved, but that's really not entirely just their responsibility to declare that to you. 
You know, it's our responsibility as those of us who say that we are Christians and say that we're followers of Christ to line ourselves and our lives up to the scriptures. And then we're, ble we're blessed to have the Bible. We're blessed to be able to carry a Bible to church. Um, we're blessed to be able to have several copies. And one of the reasons that we study the scriptures is not only to know more theology, but it's a mirror that helps us examine ourselves so that we can know where we stand before the Lord and have confidence. So what are some of the benefits of salvation? What are some of the things that, um, that we earn, not earn, but that we receive at, when we come to Christ in faith? So the first thing that I have here is what is justification? Again, I'm not going to read through the whole handout. Um, please feel free to take this home, go over with it, your family, go over with your children, especially this time of Jesus, so much Jesus talk, I think this is a good, a good handout to have with you and understand and study and even share with others. So what is justification? I'm just going to read a couple of portions to it, the first part. This term emphasizes our judicial relationship with God when God declares us righteous. So it's not a process, it's a declaration, Okay. When you will say Jesus Christ, when you make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, you don't earn it, you don't work for it. You know, God says, I have declared you righteous, and all the benefits of being righteous you receive at that point. Okay, or that you receive at that point. So it's not a process, all right? So this is sometimes the, our understanding that we limit our salvation to. It's not any less than the other benefits, but sometimes we say, all right, I'm justified, so I can, so there's nothing else after that. I got my ticket punched and I'm going to heaven. But that's not just what salvation is. But a good picture, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but a really good picture, and this is something that Pastor Aaron pointed us to in previous sermons of Joshua the priest who is standing, who is being accused by Satan of all his sins. And the Lord is standing with him saying, I know that, but I've made him righteous. I've covered him in my robe, and he is uh, righteous in my sight. And, and Joshua, the priest, doesn't earn any of that. God pronounces him righteous, and he's given the commission to serve him as a high priest. You know, let's go ahead and read it. So, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a log snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed in filthy garments and was standing before the angel. And he responded and said to those who were standing before him, saying, Remove the filthy garments from him. Again, he said to him, See, I have taken, away your, taken your guilt away from you, and will clothe you with festive robes. Then I said, have them put a clean turban, clean headband on his head, and we've, or a turban. So he put a clean headband on his head and clothed them with garments. While the angel of the Lord was standing by, and the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, the Lord of armies says this, if you walk in my ways and perform my service, then you will both govern my house and be in charge of my courtyards and I will grant you free access among those who are standing here. And I'm not going to go ahead and read the rest, but he says, the Lord hears Satan accusing him, and he puts clean garments. So when you were saved, you were stand Satan was accusing you of everything, and Satan was absolutely right about everything he was saying. But God says, no, I paid for that person right there, and here, here's a white garment. You're a made righteous in my eyes. So you don't earn that. And you couldn't earn it. No good works, whatever you think is good, because that's the other problem. We think what we're doing is good until we go up against a holy God who um, cannot even look upon sin and evil without judging. And, and we've, this, we've, we've shared this before. If God does nothing when it comes to sin, it reflects on him, but yet he loves us and wants us to live forever with him. What does he do? He allows Jesus to die for our sins and we take on his righteousness that he earned for us. And, we, and, through his, and through his death, burial, and resurrection, we are justified. We are made righteous. We are made right before God. We are declared righteous. So what the next word down is what is propitiation? Now, that's a long word. 
Um, so what is propitiation? Right, so propitiation is what Jesus humbled himself to become for us. So if you ever get a chance, you can read Philippians chapter 2. It talks about how Jesus emptied himself and became a man. And after he became a man, he submitted to God to the point of dying on a cross. So what is propitiation? Basically, propitiation, and I'm going to read the last part of that par- the paragraph. The concept behind the word propitiation from the non-Christian view is a sacrifice that pleases the wrath of the gods. So the original meaning, I had to deal with more of a pagan understanding of appeasing the pagan gods. But in the biblical view, it is a sacrifice that appeases God's holy wrath against sin so that fellowship can be restored. So Jesus, who was God, a very God, who was the word of God, who created the universe, became a man, and man became a lamb, and he offered himself as a sacrifice to die for our sins. You know, we can hear that again and again and again, and we have to examine ourselves whether or not we believe that that really is something that we believe is important, that's valuable, and it will be reflected of how we live. And sometimes, every time we hear, hear it, we hear it preached here regularly. We've been going through the gospel, and of course, all of us would need to repent more and more because we do not value these realities as much as we should. And God forgives us, and he saved us anyway, because he knew it. He knew we would sometimes forget, and communion is just a great time where we bring these things back to, to remembrance. But Jesus not only justifies us, but we're justified through his through his sacrifice, that he becomes a lamb. One of the things that we've, we've, we've been learning as we continue to um, study under the teacher of Pastor Aaron, that for every New Testament principle, there's an Old Testament picture. So if you look at the scriptures, you see in the Old Testament, in particular, um, Exodus chapter 22, and again, you can go back and you can look over these references when you have a moment, how Abraham, how Abraham is ready to slay his son because God tells Abraham, hey, go take your son up on the mountain and slay him. And just before Abraham is about to slay his son, the angel of the Lord tells him to stop. And God has a lamb waiting for him instead of killing his son. And again, if you read in Hebrews, um, goes into it more as well. But we realize that Isaac at that moment was, was a type of Christ, offering himself freely as the father is ready to, to kill him. You know? And so Abe, Isaac is, was that picture of Christ. And that whole scene, and again, it's not another passage where you may have to sit down and meditate on to really absorb it, just how that is a picture of what Christ did for us. So we have justification, we have propitiation. So what is redemption? And yeah, we can read through this portion really quick. It means to buy back from the marketplace, right? We when we were living in sin, the Bible says that we were slaves of sin, and we were also servants of Satan. You know, so you may feel like you know you had a long history before you got saved, right? Of you were doing what you wanted to do, and maybe later in life you came to the Lord. But even when you were, maybe you got saved at five. Whatever time you came to the Lord, that was a, that was enough sin for you to be needing salvation for. It wasn't any more or less blood that was needed to cover that period, you know, whether you got saved at 5 or 45, you know, so don't feel like, you you know, like, well, you know, I came to the Lord at 5 and everything was gravy. No, it wasn't gravy. You did just as much sin to need the blood of Christ. So the concept behind redemption is explained by three Greek words, agorazo, which means to purchase from the marketplace, which denotes Jesus paying the price for our salvation. Exogazo, I'm saying that right, which means to pay the price to deliver someone from the power of another. And the last word is lotaro, 
which means paying the price to secure one's freedom. So redemption is Jesus paying the price our sin demanded so that he would, so that he would set us free from the power of sin and make us his own possession. Again, a book of the Bible that's really good to read is uh, the book of Hosea, where God commands a prophet to marry a woman who was living very promiscuously, who uh, was very unfaithful to him. And what happens to her is she ends up becoming a slave. And, you know, and that's us. We're, we're a slave to sin. We're a slave to our passions. We're a slave to, um, the thing, to sin. And what God tells Hosea to do is to go and buy her back from the marketplace. You know, this very unfaithful woman, God ha- uses Hosea as a picture of God, of himself coming to buy us back from the, from the marketplace. So that's, and in, in some way, I have other books there that kind of may touch on it a little bit, not exactly, but I think they're also good um, places in the Old Testament get a picture of what God is doing for us. Because one of the things about the Bible, it doesn't just use words, but tries to paint a picture so that we can understand God more and what he did for us. So the last word is, actually, no, it's not the last one. So the next word is adoption, right? And we're going to actually speed things up a little bit. We are brought into God's family with adult privileges. So one of the things about understanding us being adopted is it's it's different than regeneration in the sense that it emphasizes that we're brought into God's family with full adult privileges. So when we're brought into God's family, we're we're not having to wait to earn the privileges that come with salvation. As soon as you get saved, you, are, you have access to spiritual growth. Um, you have access to hope for the future, the heaven. You get the Holy Spirit. You can get insight. You don't have to wait to, to really receive everything that God has for you. Once you're called, brought into the family, you can jump right in. And my brother Mike, you know, is just such an example. He jumped right in. And for those that know him, this brother jumped right in. Is helping other people, ready to go. Um, so when we're adopted, that's kind of what adoption means, not just bring, coming into the family, but also being brought in with full adult privileges. So one, one Old Testament story that really emphasizes this um, is David and Meshibosheth. I think I said that right. Meshibosheth. There you, Janae's going to say it for me. There you go. She said it for me. So, and, and these are things, and if you're feeling like, man, I feel like some of this has been talked about before. It has. Um, we've been going through the gospel for several weeks now, so none of this should sound super new. Some things should sound similar. Some things may I'll say differently, whereas Pastor Aaron may have said it differently, but we're all talking about the same. What is the, are the, what is the gospel, and what are the benefits of the gospel? And really, a lot of what I'm sharing is things that Pastor Aaron has already shared, how the gospel is not just A, B, and then no more letters, right? It's A to Z. It's not just the beginning, but it's the beginning and the end, and we're just expounding on that. So you can go, you can go ahead and read Just the story, his story. Um, The next part of salvation, this is where we may park a little bit longer, is regeneration. So what is regeneration? And I'll go ahead and read. Regeneration is a theological term for what we know as being born again. We are given the Holy Spirit, which empowers our process of sanctification and makes us more into Christ's image. The scripture teaches that if we are in Christ, we are a new creature and, we, and have a new man that we are called to put on. Salvation is not just a change in situation, but a change in being. Evidence of this change should be new desires, a new relationship with sin, and a new way of thinking. The prophet Samuel, before he was anointed king, was told that when he arrived at the Oak of Tabor, he would be filled with the Spirit and turned into another man. In Numbers 11, the 70 elders under Moses were filled with the Spirit, and they also prophesied. Evidence of salvation is a genuine change facilitated 
by the Holy Spirit. And so this is actually really important because sometimes we think, well, salvation is just that means to get to heaven. But the evidence of it happening in our life is an inward change. And someone can, you can ask someone about that and say, hey, you know, have I been changed? And you can do that. And that's important to do. Other people should see this change, but you also need to know, hey, have I been changed? And, and, and that's, the, that's what we need to do in our own lives. You know, we have to get on our knees and say, yo, am I really showing the evidence that this has taken place? You know, salvation isn't just me saying, yes, I believe Jesus Christ is God. I believe he died for my sins, and I live any kind of way that I want to live. Part of salvation is that he saves us not just from, and that my brother shared it beautifully, not just to go to heaven, but save us from sin, you know. And doesn't mean we don't stumble, but we see that work happening in our lives. And so we have to ask ourselves, is regeneration, have I been regenerated? Have I been changed, you know? And the next, and partnered with that is sanctification. So the regeneration helps us in our sanctification, and basically Sanctification is us, means being set apart to God. And so regeneration isn't necessarily a process. We are regenerated, we're changed. But sanctification is that process where we move far, farther away from sin and evil and closer to God as our character becomes more like Christ. It is the process of Romans 8.28 where God through the Spirit helps us conform to the image of Christ. Paul commands us that we are not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And God also helps us in this process by disciplining us so that we can continue to grow. An example of God's working to help us grow is God's dealings with Israel. While Israel was delivered from Egypt, God still needed to get Egypt out of their hearts. And God used the wilderness experience to teach them to rely and trust on him. God used a thorn in the flesh in Paul's life to keep him humble. And Jerry Bridges, in his book, The Pursuit of Holiness, describes the process of sanctification. And this is actually a really important quote. A farmer plows his field, sows the seed, and fertilizes and cultivates all the while knowing that in the final analysis he is utterly dependent on the forces outside of himself. He knows he cannot cause the seed to germinate, nor can he produce the rain and the sunshine growing and harvesting the crop. For a successful harvest, he is dependent on the things from God. Yet the farmer knows that unless he diligently pursues his responsibilities to plow, plant, fertilize, and cultivate, he cannot expect a harvest at the end of the season. In a sense, he is a, in partnership with God, and he will reap its benefits only when he has fulfilled his own responsibilities. Farming is a joint venture between God and the farmer. The farmer cannot do what God must do, and God will not do what the farmer should do. We can say just as accurately that in the pursuit of holiness is a joint venture between God and the Christian. No one can attain any degree of holiness without God working in his life, but just as surely no one will attain it without effort on his own part. God has made it possible for us to walk in holiness, but he has given us the responsibility of doing the walking. He does not do that for us. And, and the scripture that we can look at is Philippians 2, 12 to 13. It says, Paul says that we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, for God is working in us. So sanctification is really that process where, we can, we, where, we, where God empowers us to become more like Christ. And as I mentioned earlier in Hebrews chapter 12, sometimes God will have to pull us back so that we can get on the right track if we're his child for sanctification. So the two things we really need to ask ourselves personally as Christians, you know, is the work, have I really been changed? You know, that's something that we have to ask ourselves, you know, am I having the same desires I had before? Is my relationship the same as it was before? You know, do I get convicted about sin? So even when I do sin, my response to it, has that changed? You know, and then am, am, am I, do I feel God's disciplining hand in my life? 
You know, is he allowing just things to happen and, and he's hands off? You know, and again, you have to ask that question. You have to do that business with God on your own. And this is a good season to do it, you know, as we're in the Christmas season and a lot of things are focused on family and gifts and plans and, you know, an another good thing for, and resolutions, what am I going to do next year that's different from this year? What Maybe we can all maybe take some time to really examine ourselves as am I truly walking, living the Christian faith? Do I have the evidence of salvation in my life, you know, am I saved? And there's nothing wrong with doing that, you know. It's it's a good thing. It's healthy, you know. I do it, you know. Even even pastors need to do it, you know. There's a, I have other scriptures, but you know, there's a scripture, Matthew chapter seven, where it says many Jesus tells, and it was actually really deep. He tells people, many are going to come up to me and say, Lord, Lord, um, and they'll think that, hey, have I did prophesied in your name, cast out demons, but he'll say, depart from me, right? I never knew you. So Jesus, very early on in his ministry, said there's going to be people that are going to think that they are saved, that they think they're experiencing me, and they are not. And this is not meant to be a fearful a sharing or make people afraid, but we're called to examine ourselves. Um, so let's go to the last part of the handout. You know, and this is really where we're going to really, uh, my first and final closing, because I don't have any other closings. Um, I really don't. So I'm just going to repeat what I, I mentioned before. You know, and these are not the only benefits. There's, there's glorification, right? We'll have new bodies. We will no longer have to experience death. Um, there's so many other, there are some others. Go over the handouts. Um, there's several handouts that Pastor Aaron has put out there. Outline. I mean, they're great. I looked at them in, in preparing for this one, so please take a look at those handouts. They are wonderful. Um, of other benefits of the gospel, forgiveness. Um, you get, come into community, you get a new family, you have peace with God. So please go over those handouts. But let's go over this last portion. What is my personal responsibility? What is my personal responsibility? Salvation is a wonderful thing but it's up to us individually to examine ourselves to see if we really have been born again. Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, 5 shares, examine yourselves, see whether you are in the faith, test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. We must take time to go through the scriptures using the scripture as a mirror to examine ourselves to see if we are truly born again. If you are unsure, it is never too late to seek God and to pray and put your faith in Jesus Christ for your salvation. If you need help below, if you need help below are some good places to start. Um, the book of 1 John, if you're not sure, 1 John is a really good book. It talks about what does it look like to really be a believer. It talks about how is your relationship with sin? You know, do you get convicted? How is your relationship with the brethren of other Christians? Do you love other Christians or do you, are you repelled by other Christians? You know, are you aiming to walk in holiness? So 1 John is definitely a great book to go through if you need somewhere to start to say, am I really born again? And then Romans 6 through 8 really talks about the inner struggle. Sometimes we can feel like, man, I'm not really saved because I'm struggling with sin. But sometimes the struggle is actually the evidence that you are. Right? You don't live, like dead people don't struggle. You know, living people struggle. You know, if God has made you alive in the spirit, one of, the, one of those things, the evidence is you have that struggle between the flesh and the spirit in your heart. Amen, right? I mean, I had to struggle with the flesh and the spirit in my heart. You know, and, and, and sometimes we can get discouraged because we have that struggle. And I think sometimes we can be a little unfair because we think that being a spiritual person means no struggle. Right when really no, the struggle is the sign that yeah, like I am spiritual and I need help, and and God gives us the church, God gives us brothers and sisters to pray for us, He gives us the word, He gives us insight, you know. So those are just some two areas where if you feel like you need just help wrestling with salvation in your life, um, you can go to those scriptures. So there's three kinds of people um, that you know that 
I'm hoping that this message would help someone with. Um, the first group, those that are saved yet need assurance that they are, right? There's people that are, you're out here, you're watching online, you want, you're saved, but you just feel like it's slipping, you know? So I hope that as we went through just these benefits of salvation, that you can see God's, God working in your life and that you're sure that, that, hey, God has really done what he said he did in your life, that he saved you and that, and that when Jesus comes, comes, you'll be with him forever. The second group of people are those that are not saved that need to repent and put their faith in Christ. So if you're not a Christian and, and you're looking for something in your life and this resonated with you, please allow Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. Say yes to him. And if you have questions, please, you can ask one of the elders. You can send us an email. And if you need to, more, to research more, there's so much online of who Jesus is online on Antioch's webpage, um, sermons and handouts, if you need more information before you make that decision. But don't wait too late. You know, today is the day of salvation. But this is another group that I'm hoping to help, you know, for those that may not know Christ. The third group is one that we have, that the Bible really talks about. Um, it, 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 it should grieve us, but the reality is there is a third group that, that they believe that they're saved, but they're not. You know, they believe that they're in Christ, but they really are not. And even Jesus, again, mentions in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. And I'll go ahead and read that. Matthew 7, 21 and 23. It says this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So it's a sobering word. You, you know, it's sobering in the sense that, you know, there's going to be these three different groups of people. Um, some that are saved that need assurance. Some that are not saved, but, but they're ready to come to Christ. That, and then you have this other group that people that think they are saved and are not. But God has blessed us with this message because all of us have the scriptures in front of us um, to, to help us real, to understand whether or not we're truly saved. And if you're wrestling in your heart, you know, am I a Christian? Am I born again? You know, please just don't ignore that voice. You know, when you're hearing the Christmas music and you're here and all the pomp and circumstance are coming and, and you're like, man, I wonder who Jesus is. Follow that voice. Um, listen to it. Um, and please don't let this day go by without seriously taking um, the claims of Christ seriously. Please thank you for your time. You know, this. Uh, please go over the handout when you have a moment. If you have any family members that are not sure, please use this to your advantage. Um, Worship team, please come on up. Thank you very much.